Good evening. Uh, welcome to the 6 p.m. press conference here on the CZU complex. My name is Jonathan Cox, Deputy Chief for CAL FIRE San Mateo Santa Cruz Unit and Line Officer on the incident. As always, if you could mute your cell phones, take any conversations away from the press conference area, and keep your masks on at all times, it would be greatly appreciated. Additionally, with, uh, there will be moments uh, at the end of the speakers to ask any questions uh, for some more specific answers. With that, I'll get right into the incident update for this evening here on the CZU uh, complex. I, we can confirm that the fire is now 81,137 acres, uh, 81,137. Uh, the good news is we are up to 21% containment. So that is obviously an increase over uh, this morning. There are, however, still 20, over 24,000 structures that are threatened uh, due to this incident. And unfortunately, the number of structures that we can confirm that have been destroyed is 590. Of the 590 structures destroyed, 11 of those are in San Mateo County, and 579 of those are in Santa Cruz County. Currently, there are still uh, mass evacuations in place across the incident area. Uh, uh, we also have additional crews that have come in throughout the day, and we now have 1,982 firefighting personnel assigned to the incident. With that, I'll hand it over to CAL FIRE Incident Management Team 3, Chief Mark Brunton, for an operations update. Good evening. Uh, so we had another uh, good successful day of, uh, of suppression on the fire. Um, the weather uh, threw a few hindrances our way that I'll, I'll go into later, but overall uh, some, some good success and continued success as, uh, as we speak this evening. Uh, as uh, mentioned earlier in the Division Golf Kilo, that line is still continuing to hold. That uh, is very critical as far as uh, keeping any sort of fire spread uh, to the north and to the east, uh, which would uh, potentially threaten Santa Clara County, but that's shut off, and uh, we continue to monitor and mop up and patrol that, and that's looking really good. Uh, continue more line construction and, and letting the fire back down to our control line, uh, Butano, uh, that, uh, and that, that's just creeping down. The weather is helping mitigate that, uh, but that's part of our strategy so that we can bring it to more favorable ground in which to wor uh, work on. Um, the communities of uh, Pescadero, La Honda, Loma Mar are looking really good. Uh, so we're just continuing to monitor that part of the fire and, and, and trying to wrap that up to make that safe. Uh, working down the Highway 1 corridor, uh, we're having more and more success with that, putting a control line where we need to. Some of the fire is self-mitigated, as I've, I've said before, and, that, and we're just continuing to monitor that. Uh, Davenport's looking really good. It, I know today they were working on uh, re-energizing the, the electricity to that community, and so we're trying to start to get that up and running. A lot of work along Highway 1 by PG&E restoring the infrastructure there, as well as Caltrans to make sure that the road is, is safe to pass. Our uh, line to the south continues to hold, looks really good. That's protecting the communities of Santa Cruz and the UC campus. So I was just there just about an hour ago. It looks really solid and we're very comfortable with that. In particular, because we're gonna start seeing a weather change where we're gonna see a northerly push of a wind uh, moving into this, uh, this weekend. So um, I feel comfortable that that's gonna hold. And what'll be also good with that wind blowing on that is what we call a wind test. And that means that the lines will hold based on the wind, an adverse wind to it. So we believe that that will survive a wind test. And to us, that's a, that's a great measure of success because it means that that fire is extinguished and our lines are, are doing what they're supposed to do. Uh, the Highway 9 corridor, so Felton's looking uh, really good. We've got good line around about three quarters of it. Um, and uh, we're continuing to put line up through the, uh, the Highway 9 corridor behind the communities of Ben Loman, Boulder Creek. A lot of crews, uh, as we're getting crews in, we've received a few more hand crews come in and they are working. Uh, we've put them right to work, so uh, we're having a lot of success with that, and we're going to continue to have a lot of success with that. Um, and uh, down it, just between Ben Loman and Felton, I was talking about a burnout operation. Just came directly from that operation right now. Um, we're taking that slow, methodical. Uh, the weather conditions um, had to delay that operation because, as we saw today, uh, a some fog that stuck around a long time. It kept the, the, the fuel moistures and the relative humidity up. So we really had to wait before we started uh, lighting that fire so that we have an effective burn and one that we can control readily. So uh, as I left the line shortly ago, it's looking good, it's burning well, it's doing exactly what we want it to do. It's just gonna take us a little bit longer to c accomplish that mission uh, than we originally thought because of the weather. And uh, But we're looking at making that line go uh, just on the backside of Felton, 
uh, just below Ben Loman and, and tie into uh, to Highway uh, 9. So that'll give us a good level of protection uh, for the community of Felton, as, and then we'll continue up, uh, as uh, we stated, up the Highway 9 corridor. Bonnie Dune, Bonnie Dune's looking really good. Um, we've got a lot of resources in there. They continue to mop up around homes. They're continuing to find any fire that are in some of the ravines and gullies and drainages and start to extinguish that and mop that up. Um, there are a lot of hazard trees in there. We've had a number of trees fall across uh, uh, Felton uh, Empire Grade Road that we've had to bring the, our, our specialty uh, crews in to, uh, to open up the road, cut those trees down, um, and also we're going and, and eliminating any of the hazard trees, the ones that are burning out that could pose a hazard to our personnel or any of the utility uh, company folks that are working in that area to start restoring that infrastructure, which they are doing uh, on our heels as we uh, open up the roadways throughout the fire and also through the 236 corridor, uh, working with Caltrans so that we can move deeper and get into the park. Um, and uh, and then the utility companies coming behind to start setting up their infrastructure to, to restore. Um, one uh, matter to note regarding our burnout operation and unfortunate situation is as I said this morning, we have highly qualified individuals that are setting up, planning, and, and running that operation. One of our uh, personnel, the commanders that uh, is setting up and running that operation, unfortunately last night, um, somebody broke into his uh, fire department vehicle and stole his protective equipment. Um, sad to say, so it kind of delayed the operation as well. He was able to get uh, restocked with the equipment and uh, continue forward with his mission. So a little bit of delay, unfortunately, due to that circumstance, uh, but uh, Scotts Valley, Valley uh, Police Department is working in conjunction with our law enforcement officials uh, to deal with that issue and, and uh, moving forward with that. Aircraft, aircraft unfortunately due to the, uh, the weather today couldn't really get a lot of hours of flying. So as I've been saying in previous days, we've been able to max out our aircraft, drop a lot of water. Today wasn't as successful unfortunately because we just could not fly the aircraft due to the weather. As soon as we had the small window of opportunity, we did. And we were only able to, to uh, drop about 10,000 gallons of water. Uh, still not bad, but uh, we, to, you know, in order to support our ground troops, you just couldn't do the maximum effort that we've been seeing the past few days. That's just part of the job and the nature of the job that uh, we have to be able to bounce back from that. And we improvised from that and just continued on with our, our march up uh, throughout the uh, fire line to take care of it and uh, start mitigating that circumstance for us. Uh, we believe that coming weather uh, that we will see in the next few days, it's going to be better for us and we're going to have better days ahead and, and be able to maximize that, that effort. Thank you. Speaking next from the Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Office is Chief Deputy Chris Clark. Well, good evening. So uh, again, today, this operational period marks number four, the fourth operational period we've had so far where we haven't needed to arrest anyone. I think that's a positive. Uh, we did have to, to cite one person, uh, and I'll, I'll talk about that here in just a minute, but uh, I wanted to kind of go through some numbers with you as I typically do. So uh, today we had 70 personnel working uh, throughout the San Lorenzo Valley tonight. We're gonna have, uh, we're gonna have 60 folks uh, doing the same task of security checks and welfare checks and, and responding to calls for service. That's 11 of our folks that'll be working, 20 from in county, and then uh, 20 mutual aid. In terms of calls for service, we, uh, we received and responded to nine welfare checks 15 and 15 suspicious people. So in regards to the person we cited, uh, this morning I spoke about a, uh, a gentleman, 73-year-old gentleman who was initially evacuated, uh, left his home, and then on Monday night uh, decided he wanted to get back in. So, uh, and, and this, might, it, this might be happening, it might have happened in the past, but I wanna kind of describe a, a situation that we dealt with today as a result of someone sneaking into an evacuated area and then ultimately needing help. So that's what happened to this person. He uh, wanted to get back to his house. He uh, found a route uh, kind of on the outskirts of the evacuated zone and then decided to make his way through a trail. And unfortunately, he got lost. He got into an area that was uh, very steep. Um, and uh, luckily for him, he, he literally, he survived two nights in the woods, two nights until he was able to make that phone call um, or until his friend made a phone call on his behalf uh, last night, which then initiated our response to it. And so then we became involved. And, and as I mentioned this morning, we, we were going to devote all kinds of resources to finding him, and that's exactly what we did. So we launched a search and rescue operation. But just in terms of kind of what that operation looks like, it's 100 for today. For example, for finding this person, 126 man hours. 
uh, three hours of ambulance time, two hours of helicopter time because we needed a helicopter to extricate the person because of the steep terrain. And then one of our SAR personnel, unfortunately, was hurt uh, when they crashed on a mountain bike when they were out, out looking. I bring that up, I, I, you know, I feel bad for this person because, you know, they're, they're, they're just trying to, they, they want to get back home. And, and I absolutely, we absolutely get it. But we had to divert all kinds of resources uh, to, uh, to help them. And so I, I put that out there because that's, that's ultimately what it can take if someone decides not to heed an evacuation order and then get in a place where they need help. Uh, luckily for him, he, he's going to make it. He's going to be okay. And so he was uh, taken for some medical treatment and, uh, and, uh, and issued a citation. In terms of missing persons cases, uh, we had some progress on that front also. So uh, as I mentioned this morning, we were up to six. Today our detectives uh, narrowed that number down. We're down to three now. So three total missing persons cases. And I'll give you their names and, and their ages uh, just so the, that you guys have it and potentially the public. And those watching can help us uh, potentially if you know these people, you hear a name, sounds familiar, and, the, you, know, if it, it, and you know them and you can call them or know where they are, uh, call us. Uh, one of them is 70-year-old Henry Rinke. That's Henry Rinke, and he's 70. He was last seen on August 20th. 21-year-old Shane Smith, also last seen August 20th. And 37-year-old Micah Zoki, and he was last seen on August 15th. Now, the one thing that our detectives have advised me is that uh, these three folks, uh, right now, preliminarily, we don't believe them to be fire victims. Uh, but we don't have enough information, uh, information to confirm that without a doubt. So, I mean, there's, there could be more to come on that. But at least what we see now, we, we, we feel that there's not necessarily a strong likelihood that they, they, uh, they fell victim to fire. But, but uh, there'll be more to come on that. And hopefully, if you hear these names and, and, you, uh, and you know them, you'll, you, you'll either tell them to call us or, or, uh, or you call us, uh, which we'd greatly appreciate. Uh, and I want to touch on repopulation. It's a huge thing. I mean, just as uh, the anxiety level being evacuated out of an area, I mean, the, the anxiety of, of wondering when, I'm, when am I going to get back home? Like we can absolutely empathize with you there. And so uh, I kind of wanted to give you some rough kind of figures because if you're sitting at home and you're wondering, well, when can I get back to my house? So uh, with regards to like Scotts Valley, and I don't want to put this in perspective. So our repopulation plan, which we've had folks working on for the last few days, uh, is systematic, it's thorough. Uh, because in these mountains, as you know, uh, there's limited opportunity for e ingress and egress. So you know, the roads, there's only certain ways in and out. So we want to do this systematic. And we also want to do it when it's safe and when there's infrastructure there to support safety and support people being able to live in those areas. We, we take information from our, from our fire partners and we, we put these plans together. So what does that look like? So for the city of Scotts Valley and kind of the unincorporated area of Scotts Valley, we're talking about a day or days. And I say day or days because things, things can change and I don't want to give anyone false hope, but I, I also want to kind of give you a rough framework uh, to, kind of, to kind of wrap your mind around a little bit if you're wondering when I might get back to my house. So for the city of Scotts Valley and those areas to the north and south, um, day or days. And then as you move uh, to the west towards the city of Felton, it's days uh, I would estimate days or potentially uh, a week. And that's really dependent upon, you know, and, and as you mentioned today, or as uh, Chief Brunton mentioned, they, they, they're having uh, great success on really isolating the fire, containing the fire, uh, especially with these fire lines that they're, that they're uh, developing along that Highway 9 corridor. So with that, Felton, and then I'm gonna, and then basically as it goes north, it's, it's like, it's, it's week to weeks potentially as you get further north, as we progress into heavily uh, damaged, more heavily damaged areas, right? Towards Boulder Creek, uh, you're talking, you know, put weeks potentially uh, because of the, the fire damage that's in that area, especially the 236 area that, that, uh, that, that's west of Boulder Creek, and then weeks again for, for Bonnie Dune. And, and really it's just given the, the amount of fire damage that's in that area. I mean, Cal Fire, I went up there today. Uh, you know, Cal Fire's, they're, they're, they're trying to put out a fire, but at the same time, You've got PG&E up there trying to restore lines, and lines are dropped everywhere if you've seen pictures. And then, uh, you know, there were tree services today up there marking trees and trying to fell trees to, to make the roads a little more passable. But there's a lot of road work to be done. And then it's, there's a lot of road work to be done on the north coast uh, and in the Swanton Last Chance area. A lot of work to be done up there. So that's kind of a rough framework of kind of what that repopulation plan looks like and a rough sort of idea of when I might be able to get back home. Um, 
And then in terms of, uh, so tonight, so the uh, so UCSC is going to repopulate. Uh, you're going to see a notice go out shortly uh, from uh, from Cal Fire, and so they'll they'll talk more about that here in just a minute. But uh, uh, but Chief Oise over at the over at the school wanted me to put out a message to you that uh, with regards to the school, same thought process with repopulating the school, systematic. And if you if you are going back to the school to pay attention to emails and then uh, and follow those instructions, it's going to be a phased reopening. So definitely, if uh, if you if you live at UCSC, watch your email closely, and then um, and then you'll see instructions there. So with regards to the repopulation, and I want to put this out there also because it's going, to, it's really important on two on two levels. One, Cal Fire's done a great job of of uh, putting together a map, an interactive map. We used it when we evacuated people, and so there's a website that you can go to on our Facebook page. We're going to put this website out there. You can also find the website to this evacuation map, and we're going to use it in the reverse for repopulation. If you go to Cal Fire's website and you find the incident fact sheet for this fire, uh, you'll find a link to this map. And essentially, what it looks like right now is red. The whole—I mean, the evacuated area looks red. But you got to zoom in. You zoom in to where your street is, where your address is. It'll go to that granular level on that map. You go to, you find your street. Uh, you'll find a zone. Now that zone's important. It's important for a couple of reasons. One is that it's, it's, you know, that those zones are how we evacuate people out of areas if there's fire. That's that's what we did when we first started launching evacuations. But that's how you would know whether or not. And we're going to tell you. So there's going to be a lot of information coming with regards to uh, letting you know when you can go back home. But to be specific, you go to that website after this briefing, you'll see the, you'll see the zone that, the, that UCSC is in. If you zoomed in, it's going to turn green. And so that's the differentiation there. Red, being, red zones meaning you can't get back to, green meaning you can. So pay attention to that map. You can find it again at our, web, at our uh, uh, Facebook page, and you can also find it at, at CAL FIRE's website uh, on the incident fact sheet. And then lastly, I just want to touch on, I've heard the comment, well, if things reopen, is it going to be a foot race between me and someone potentially wanting to break into my house? And the answer to that's no, we're not going anywhere. So we're going to be here, the Sheriff's Office is going to be here with our mutual aid partners uh, until this is over, until we have, uh, and, until we're able to get people home safely and they feel safe being at home. Uh, this is going to be a process and it's not something we, we're just as quick as it's repopulated, we're leaving. Uh, you know, we're a part of this community and we're going to continue to be there as people resettle. So just to clear up any anxiety there. Thank you. Speaking next on behalf of all the Unified Incident Commanders is CAL FIRE Incident Management Team 3, IC Billy C. Hey, good evening. Obviously uh, today was a good day. We've uh, increased our containment from 19 to uh, 21 percent. We've also increased the uh, personnel numbers by almost 300 personnel. We've added additional hand crews into the mix, uh, both today and for uh, tomorrow's plan. All those numbers are going to equate into additional percent containment uh, efforts and be able to uh, create more areas that we can start to uh, repopulate. Today, today we took our first steps, uh, having uh, UC Santa Cruz uh, turning green on the map and being able to repopulate that area. So over the coming days, as we uh, continue to have success out on the line, we're going to continue that effort to move people back in to develop some type of normalcy back with this population. Thank you. And our final speaker, uh, the Cal Fire San Mateo Santa Cruz Unit, Unit Chief Ian Larkin. Good evening. Um, this is a good day. So we're, per, our percent of containment is going up. We're getting more resources here. Um, so that's going to equate uh, more work being done on the ground uh, as, as we start to move forward to get this uh, fire fully contained. Uh, Team 3 is doing an outstanding job to get the resources in here uh, and get them to the line as quickly as possible so that we can uh, uh, mitigate this as quickly as possible. A um, couple things I want to note, um, obviously our damage inspection teams are out there working hard and getting into the areas that are safe for them to get into and evaluate um, any of the structures that are damaged and get those details out to the public. Um, as uh, Chief Deputy Clark said, uh, there's a website you can go to uh, to find that information. It is linked on the CAL FIRE information sheet. Um, 
and it'll help you uh, determine, uh, uh, you can type in your address and do a search of it and it will uh, take you to that location and to help you determine whether your structure has uh, survived or if it has been destroyed. Um, I just want to point out again, as I did this morning, um, for those that have, uh, that have needs based on uh, potential destroyed structures or damaged structures, there are a couple locations you go to, to that you can get resource or inf information related to resource assistance uh, to help you. The first one is disasterassistance.gov. That's a disasterassistance.gov. The second one is you can download the FEMA application um, through the Android or Apple platforms, um, and that's the FEMA app. Or if you don't have the ability to download the FEMA app, um, you can call 1-800-621-FEMA. That's 1-800-621-FEMA. And those are uh, some uh, uh, resources that will be uh, able to assist you uh, in the recovery process. And if there's any small businesses out there that uh, sustain damage or losses, um, you can also contact um, the SB, uh, SBA, the Small Business Administration, uh, for additional assistance. Um, just, a, just a note, uh, this is still a dangerous situation. Um, this fire's been burning in some areas for 11 days. Um, the fuels out there uh, may not have consumed fully. Uh, as we said, we have trees coming down still along the roadways. Um, our utility partners... Uh, are out there doing their best to get the infrastructure back into play so that we can try to repopulate areas uh, uh, that have been damaged. And the other key point I need to make is um, if your structure has been destroyed, um, there are some environmental issues that need to be addressed uh, through the county um, uh, environmental health um, to make sure that the uh, environment is safe for people to go back into those burned areas where structures may have been lost. Uh, there are a lot of household um, items that are used uh, within our homes uh, that are con that can be contaminating uh, the area around, so they may need to isolate and, uh, uh, and clean up that site a little bit before it can actually be uh, repopulated. So um, we're doing the best we can, as quickly as we can, with the resources we have available. And uh, just remind all those that are out there still in the evacuated areas, uh, you need to be cautious when you're out and about because uh, the trees are coming down and uh, causing uh, you know issues with the roadways and potential uh, safety hazards for you all, as well as safety hazards for our crews that are out there uh, working really hard to try to get this thing uh, uh, contained uh, so that we can get everybody back into their uh, residence. So, uh, thank you. With that, we're happy to answer any questions. All right, everybody up here. Oh, go ahead. Uh, what is the strategy once the fire is contained and the area is repopulated? There may be still in, in remote areas, uh, smoldering areas, uh, things that haven't been tossed. Yeah, so the question is related to long-term strategy about suppression. And, uh, you know, Chief Orkin and I have had long conversations about what this looks like two months, three months, four months, a year down the line from now. Uh, and, and I don't think we, there's any doubt in our mind that we're going to be chasing smokes in there and putting out small uh, areas that may still be warm, uh, going on smoke checks fairly frequently. Uh, and maybe that's a good uh, a thing to, to kind of get out there is the expectation that, you know, an old growth stand of redwood trees or forests that haven't burned in 100 years, uh, unlike brush or grass that may be extinguished after 10 to 14 days, uh, this has the potential to be months of work ahead of us. Uh, and that goes hand in hand with, you know, normalcy back to the community, normalcy back to the environment. Yeah, the question was, what's the percentage of damage inspection that's done? I believe the uh, Chief uh, C can answer that. As of this evening, we've had uh, 12 damage inspection teams in place uh, working diligently each day. Um, uh, the reports this evening, we've had 55% of the uh, burned area canvassed, information collected, and validated. Obviously, there's still 45% to go, and a lot of that's going to be interior areas where we still got to get the roadways open and make it safe to do so to get in there. Any other questions? Yeah. So you're referring to the evacuation uh, order being lifted at UC Santa Cruz, is that correct? Okay, uh, so the question was, ha have the orders been lifted? And I can uh, pass that over to Chief Deputy Clark to answer. So the answer is yes. So for UCSC, the evacuation order has been lifted. 
as I mentioned uh, there in talking to Chief Ois over at UCSC, if you live on campus, pay attention to your email. Uh, there's going to be specific instructions with regards to a phased uh, approach at uh, repopulating the school. Yeah, the question was, where did the latest containment today come from and what portion of the fire? And uh, Chief uh, Brunton will answer that. Actually, uh, with uh, today's containment, we had a couple areas that uh, we felt that uh, met the cri uh, containment criteria. One of which is on the southern end. Uh, we were talking about uh, UC Santa Cruz being uh, repopulated and uh, the, the, any potential threat to the city of Santa Cruz. And so we felt that down in the, where I've mentioned before, that was a good spot to, uh, to put some containment. Um, and I think you'll see that grow over the, the coming days. That's the area that we'll see containment. We also had some more up on the coast. This map doesn't completely uh, uh, indicate that, but uh, tomorrow's map will certainly show uh, that blackened area on the map. All right, everyone up here is available for questions uh, after this press conference is over. We will reconvene here tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. for another press conference. Thanks for joining us. This, uh, this concludes the conference.